Last Sunday, we kicked off a new study series called How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. And the idea is this. When it comes to burnout or fatigue or exhaustion, every single one of us is a little bit like a bomb that's ticking down to boom. And there are certain things that uh, you can do, certain steps you can take, certain rhythms you can build into your life to get healthy with those things, with your level of fatigue and anxiety and exhaustion and all that kind of stuff, burnout. Uh, and if you don't take those steps, eventually it's going to blow up in your face. And when it does, it's going to make a mess out of everything in your life. And, and just as bad, maybe worse, is it's going to have a huge impact on all the people that are around you in your life. And so we're taking a few weeks and we're looking at what God has to say about that because he doesn't want that for your life. He wants something much better for your life. He doesn't want it to be a mess like that. He wants you to, to, to not have to deal with that. And he has some really good things to say to us about it. So again, we started last week. We're going to keep rolling this week. So if you have a Bible, open up to Romans chapter 12. If you have the Bible app on a device, a phone or a tablet, Romans chapter 12, that's where we're going to be almost the whole way this morning. So just hang out there. If we do anything else that you need to track with, as far as scripture goes, we'll throw it on the screen for you. But Romans 12, if you have it, open it up uh, and, and we'll just kind of camp out there. A few years ago, uh, well, more than a few years ago, it's been a while, uh, I was a student at Youngstown State University and I took some marketing courses. These are entire classes that are built to teach people in them how to know your audience and take cues from society and, and build advertising and communication campaigns around making a product or a service or something like that attractive to consumers. That's the, the whole idea. How do you take something and make people want to buy it? That's the idea. And in this class, there was a CEO named Michael Brenner. This quote was in one of our books from this guy. And I want to share the quote with you because it summarizes this well. He said, content marketing is the gap between what brands produce and what consumers actually want. So the idea is if you're really good at marketing, you know who your audience is and you know what they want or what they need. Or maybe it's you know what they think they want or, or need. And you know how to take a product or a service and make people think that it can meet that need or that it can scratch that itch or fulfill that desire in their life. You can make people think, hey, this is the answer to the problem. This is the thing you're looking for. That's what marketers do. And the good ones are really, they're able to do it in a memorable way. They can sink a hook in your brain before you even know that they're doing it. And, and so you remember those things. And I want to show you what I mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you like a slogan, an advertising slogan or a tagline. And I want to see if you can tell me what company that slogan belongs to. Okay, a little participation. So I need you awake. I need you loud. And, and let's do this. Uh, we'll do a little crowd participation. All right, I'll give you a slogan. You tell me whose slogan it is. The first one, really, really easy. Just do it. Nike, yeah, yeah, easy one. All right, how about this one? The best a man can get. Gillette, eat fresh. Subway, good, good. The happiest place on earth. Cleveland Brown Stadium. You got it. Maybe she's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. And here's the last one, have it your way. Burger King, right? See what I mean? Good marketing sticks with you. The people who do it well, they're able to craft these things to stick with you. But here's the problem, all right? I want to I reveal something about marketing. I want to tell you what the problem is. The problem is that there's one thing that's not all that important to marketers, and that is telling you the truth. Now, I'm not going to say that companies hire marketers to lie to you, and I'm not saying that marketers have ill intentions, at least not all of them. But companies also don't necessarily hire marketers to be fully honest with their audience. That's not their job. Their one goal is to convince you that you need whatever the thing is that they're selling you. That's what marketers want to do. And so I've been thinking, wouldn't it be great if marketing was just fully honest? Wouldn't it be great if somebody passed a law and said, hey, you're marketing, you just got to be totally honest so that nobody gets to the point where it's too late and they've already bought this thing and then they find out this isn't what I thought I was buying. It doesn't fulfill the need I thought it fulfilled. I think it would be great if advertising just had to be totally honest. And so I want to show you what this could look like. I came across this online a little while ago. I'm going to give you some examples of what honest marketing might look like. We'll put some of these on the screen. Check this out. Here's the first one. Lego, the bane of your foot's existence. <laughs> Parents, if you've ever stepped on one of those in the dark, that is an experience you don't forget, right? Uh, next one. Starbucks, we serve you decaf if you're rude. That's the meanest thing you can do to another human. Next one. Candy Crush, the game version of pure cocaine. 
Some of you in the room need rehab. Next one. Netflix, spend more time searching than actually watching. Yep, okay. WebMD, convince yourself you have a terminal illness. It's common cold, but you're calling in hospice, right? Next one. Ikea, we throw in extra parts just to mess with you. Uh, and final, uh, two more. Old Spice, smell like grandpa. How's that for a tagline? Uh, and last one, yellow pages. Here, you throw this away. Maybe it's a little ridiculous, but wouldn't it be just a little bit nice, honestly, if, if marketers had to be honest like that, if, if they had to be right up front instead of making you wait till later to find out what these things are really about? It makes me think of this. Uh, many of you know my wife, Ashley, or you've met her, seen her on social media, or bumped into her in the hallway. And a few years ago, when we first met, we were getting to know each other, and uh, I, we found out that we have this shared love of going to the movies. We both love going to a movie theater, and I like to go there to take naps because it's dark and it's cold, and for some reason, I sleep super well in a theater, but she actually likes the movie. So anyway, when I decided I was going to ask her out, it just made sense that we go to the movies. So Jurassic World had just hit theaters, and I said, hey, do you want to go see this with me? And she said, yeah. So we went to Tinseltown up on the Strip, and we got there. I bought our tickets. We walked in the theater. We went to the snack bar, and I bought our popcorn and our drinks and our candy. And we walk into the theater, and this was before reserve seating because, you know, now y'all are spoiled. You go and, and you get, the, you know, your seat reserved for you. But I remember, and many of you remember, when you'd have to show up to the theater early and, you know, you got to like get seats if you want to sit together or whatever. This is before reserved seating. So we walk in the theater, we find a row with some open chairs and I walk in and I sit down and she follows me into the row and she sits down, a seat away from me, a full seat away. And she stayed there the entire movie. She never moved. And I didn't know what to make of that. I thought this was a date but I thought maybe I misread the whole thing. I bought the tickets and all the stuff and maybe it wasn't supposed to be a date. And now she's sending me a message here. She's like, hey, I'm gonna leave this seat because this is not a date. So I didn't move either. And we talked to each other through the whole movie over this open seat in between us. It's the weirdest first date I've ever been on. And I just kept thinking, this is the weirdest first date I've ever been on. I don't know what, what's going on with this girl. What did I get myself into? She was just nervous, I guess. And then it made me nervous, but I just kept thinking, what did I get myself into? Now it worked out because I liked her a lot and for some reason she liked me and now we're married and we kiss and stuff so we got over the open seat thing and we actually sit next to each other when we watch movies now. Uh, but that, you ever had that experience where you get into a situation and you think, what did I get myself into? What did I get myself into? I'll bet you've had that experience. I may not know you, but I'll bet you've had that feeling, that realization. Maybe you got a new job and you, you're settling in on the first day and getting all your stuff in your cubicle or your workspace set up, and then you find out that the coworker next to you does nothing but crunch tortilla chips all day long, and you think you might lose your mind, or you can't stand your boss, or, or the job's not what you thought it would be, and you just think, what did I get myself into? Maybe you bought a car and you drove it off the used car lot, but before you even got home, it started making a noise. And you thought, what did I get myself into? Maybe you show up to freshman orientation at college and you're excited, it's a new chapter in your life and you're moving into your dorm room, but then your roommate shows up and you find out she only listens to country music and she likes cats and she knits them sweaters all the time and poses them for Instagram photos and stuff like that. And you're like, this is weird. And so you think, what did I get myself into? Maybe you've had that experience. I don't know what it might've been for you, but I'll bet you felt that. Now you wanna know something? Here's another experience I know some of you in the room have had. I know you've had that, that feeling of what did I get myself into with your faith? Either following Jesus or your experience with the church, I know you've had that feeling. Maybe from the outside looking in, it all seemed good. And somebody painted you a blue sky and they told you all kinds of nice things about how great it would be. But then you started following Jesus and you quickly found out it was not what you thought you were signing up for or you quickly found out it was not as advertised. Some of you have had that experience and you thought, what did I get myself into? Well, picture this. What if Christianity took a similar approach to those honest brand slogans we looked at a few minutes ago? What if, what if Christians, what if Jesus, what if the church, what if we just put the brutal truth right up front and said, this is what it's all about and it, it was fully transparent, fully as advertised? What, what, what would that be like? Wouldn't that be great? What would that be like? 
Well, it's funny you ask because let me tell you something. You know who was a really, really bad marketer? Horrible marketer. Jesus. He was a terrible marketer. Here's a guy who's trying to start a movement. You would think he's trying to build a following of some kind, right? And he's advertising with slogans like these. He's out there saying things like, hey, if you want to receive, you want, you want, some, you want to receive, you have to give. You, you want to achieve greatness? This is what marketers talk to us all the time about. You want your life to be better? You want to be better? You want to win? You want to achieve greatness? Jesus said, you have to make yourself less. You, you want to be first? You have to be last. You want to be strong? You have to become weak. You want to be exalted? Well, you have to humble yourself. And all his Twitter followers are unsubscribing because they're like, this is not what I signed up for. He's a horrible marketer. Those are not ways to attract a following. It's ways to drive people away. Well, you know what? It is backwards. It's backwards from conventional wisdom. It's backwards from what culture tells you and me. And, and it's backwards from everything we see, every pattern we see in the world around us. Everything about Jesus, his whole persona was wrapped up in this idea of going against the grain, of pushing back on society and doing things a different way. That's who he was. And that's what's made him so controversial and it's what's made following him such a challenge for so many people over the years. It's what's made it so difficult. Well, today we're going to look at these verses in Romans chapter 12, and, and, and at first glance, these verses are also going to seem difficult. It's going to feel like bad marketing, okay? Uh, but we're going to look at these verses, and we're going to unpack some things in these verses that when you come to understand what they mean, you find out, hey, this actually might be better than it looks. And so we're going to get into this starting in Romans 12, verse 1. If you have it open, follow with me. Paul writes, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I want to pull a couple of things out of that. He starts this verse by saying, therefore. And anytime you're reading the Bible and you see that word therefore, you have to stop and ask what it's there for. Okay, he's just spent 11 chapters, the first part of the book of Romans, this letter he's writing to the church in Rome, explaining who God is and, and explaining, hey, this God, he's different than all the other gods you know. Those gods are just full of wrath. They just want to like strike you down when you do one thing wrong. But this God, yes, he has wrath, but it's because he loves you and he's jealous. He wants you to love him. And, but you know what? He's got so much grace and so much mercy for you that even while you're still sinners, Paul says in the book of Rome, before you clean your life up and before you figure it all out before you get everything in order while you're still a mess while you're still a sinner while you're still what Paul calls the enemy Jesus died for you because he loves you that much and so Paul explains this he explains mercy and he explains grace and he explains forgiveness and he explains that Jesus wants us and he lays all of that out in Romans chapters 1 through 11 and then he gets to this verse in Romans chapter 12 where he turns a corner and he starts to explain, he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, so understanding all this stuff I've told you about God with that in mind, here's what you do. And he goes on and he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is something that people in Rome understood because their system of worship, they had all sacrificed or seen sacrifice or been around sacrifice. For the Jews who had been God's people for centuries and centuries, they had sacrificed to God. But even for people who worshiped false gods, imaginary, lower case G gods, like they understood sacrifice too because they would sacrifice produce or an animal or something, the fruits of their labor. Some pagan forms of worship uh, would even do human sacrifice. They would take people and they'd kill them and put them on an altar and burn them and offer them to their false gods. And so they understood sacrifice, but Paul just says something different in here. He says, hey, you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I'm sure a whole lot of eyebrows were raised in the room in Rome when they read this letter. Because living sacrifice doesn't make sense. When you sacrifice something, you kill it and you burn it and you offer it to God. Living sacrifice? The word for sacrifice in the Greek language is thesia and it literally means to kill. And so what Paul is saying here is, hey, in view of God's mercy, understanding what he's done for you and everything that that means, you need to be a living killing. You need to offer your bodies as a living killing. You know why I like that? 
I like that because sometimes I think we read these words living sacrifice and we th- it, it can sound like a passive thing, like something somebody does to you. But, but Paul says you need to offer yourself as a living killing. Every single day when you wake up and your head pops off the pillow, you need to kill, you need to murder your desires and your wants and your human nature and your own life. You need to, you need to kill it all and you need to offer it to God as a sacrifice and say it's not about me anymore now, it's about you. And then he goes on, he says, if you will do that, it's holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. He says, it doesn't make sense to go to the temple anymore and sacrifice stuff. Don't do that. He says, I just told you in 11 chapters that Jesus was the sacrifice to you. So it doesn't make sense to go sacrifice stuff anymore. You're the sacrifice. Offer your life as a living sacrifice to God. It's the only thing that makes sense. It's the only thing that makes sense. So this presents a question for us that we can't ignore today. The question for you and me is, what's this look like to be a living sacrifice? What's this mean? And um, how do we do it? Well, fortunately for you and me, Paul goes on to explain the rest of Romans chapter 12 and then continuing on into the book of Romans, what it means to be a living sacrifice. And we're gonna look at this uh, for a few minutes. Romans 12 verse two. Paul starts to write again. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that's step one. Paul says, hey, start here. Look around. You see the world? You see all the patterns? You see everything that's going on? Don't do that. Don't do that stuff. Be better. Be different. Just set apart. That's what holy means. The word holy just means set apart. You're different. Paul says, you be different. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. What pattern is he talking about? I can tell you how I'd answer that question because when I look at the world around, I I see some patterns too, guys. I, I I see patterns like this. I see patterns like people who want to achieve greatness and so they're climbing the ladder at all costs with little to no regard for who they have to step on along the way to get there. I see patterns of people who want to receive, and so they take, and they take, and they take, and, and they just want more and more and more, but they don't live generously. They don't give. I see patterns of people who want to win, and so they'll win at all costs. I see patterns of people who want to be strong. They don't want to be weak. Weakness is unacceptable. In fact, if they see signs of weakness in somebody else, they judge it. I don't want to be weak. I want to be strong. I see patterns of people. They don't want to serve. They want to be served. And so they live very selfishly or very pridefully. I, I see people who want to be first. And so they prioritize themselves over everybody else. They prioritize their wants and their needs over everyone else's. And they have little or no concern for other people. I, I see people who want to be exalted. And they'll do whatever it takes to get the limelight. And the outcome of that, the result is, I see patterns like hopelessness and exhaustion and frustration and desperation, I see a whole lot of people who are running themselves ragged in this vain and endless pursuit of more and more and more and more and more. And they're searching for this purpose and meaning in places they're never gonna find it. Somebody in the room this morning needs to hear that because that's you. I don't know who you are, but you are searching and searching and searching for more but you're looking in the wrong places. But here's the deal, if that's struggle for you, there's some hope. We see an example of this in Mark chapter 10. We're gonna learn from this. Jesus has been in this city, he's been teaching, uh, and he's just packing up and getting ready to move on. And, and in the book of Mark, we see this rich young ruler who, who sees Jesus heading out of town, and so he runs to catch up to him, and he stops him, and here's the encounter that follows. Mark 10, starting in verse 17, says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not lie. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. So Jesus looked at him and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Here's a man who, he's young, he's powerful, he's rich. By worldly standards, he's doing pretty well. 
but he's identified a, a void in his life. He's identified an emptiness or a longing. He has this need and he doesn't know how to fill it, but something in him is drawn to Jesus and he thinks maybe he's got the answer. And so he comes to him and he says, what do I do? And instead of giving him the answer, Jesus gives him this list. It's a list of some of the 10 commandments from the Old Testament. Specifically, he names the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th commandments. And the man says, hey, I'm good with all that, Jesus. All that stuff, I've been doing that since I was a kid. That's not a problem. That can't be it. Here's the interesting thing. Those commandments are the ones of the 10 that relate to how people operate with each other. It's like how I relate to you, how you relate to me. Things like don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. That affects human relationships. And so when it came to the man's human relationships, he's saying, Jesus, I'm good. But here are some of the commandments Jesus didn't mention. He didn't mention commandments like the first one that says, don't have any other gods. And he didn't mention the second commandment that says, hey, don't have any idols, no other objects of worship in your life. And he didn't mention the third commandment that says, hey, don't misuse the name of God. And he didn't mention the fourth commandment that says, hey, remember the Sabbath, remember that God wants you to set aside time to rest and to focus on him and, and, and keep that day holy. Jesus didn't mention those commandments, the ones that, uh, that speak to how we relate to God. And so why, why did the man go away sad? Well, he didn't go away sad because he didn't understand. He understood perfectly. And he didn't go away sad because he didn't believe. If he didn't believe, he wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place. And he didn't go away sad because he was rich, because money's not the point of the story. Here's the point of the story. Jesus didn't mention those commandments because he knew completely that that's what this man struggled with. You see, this, this rich young ruler did have a God, and his God was his money. It was his stuff. He did have an idol, and his idol was his lifestyle. He did misuse the name of God because he was a ruler, specifically a religious ruler. He was a leader in the church, and, and, and he's claiming, he's presenting this image like he's got it all together, and he's in a good place with God, but he really wasn't. Because when Jesus asked him to surrender his stuff, he couldn't do it, right? Like he names these things and, and this man knew that he wasn't where he needed to be in, in his positioning with God. And so he went away sad because he couldn't picture his life without his stuff. And he held it so tight-fisted, he couldn't open his hand and give it to God when Jesus asked him to. And, and he went away sad. He was held captive by the pattern of the world that he was trapped in. And he couldn't break free of it. He couldn't break free. Maybe you can relate. Maybe it's not money, but maybe there's something else in your life that, uh, that you're held captive by. Maybe a pattern of the world that you're trapped in. And you're unwilling to surrender it to God. You're unwilling to give it to him. But here's the deal. You gotta know Jesus wants everything. He wants it all. He wants the big things and the small things. He wants you to surrender bad things, unhealthy habits, destructive patterns in your life, but he wants the good stuff too. He wants everything you are and everything you have. He wants you to hold it open-handed and give it to him. He wants everything. Here's the truth that we see in this encounter with this rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. This is what it boils down to, you ready? If you only remember one thing today, remember this. If you don't trust God with your all, eventually you won't trust him at all. If you don't trust God with your all, eventually you won't trust him at all. But you need to know that there's hope for you if that's you. Because here's what Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 12 and the rest of verse two. He says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, what that means is let God reframe the way you see your life. Let him give you a new perspective. Let him reprogram your thought processes and change the way you think about things and, and change the way you see your life. Because here's the deal, how you see your life shapes your life. 
I call that the principle of perspective, and that's kind of what this is all about today. How you see your life shapes your life, and Paul is saying, let God change the way you see your life. Let him reshape that. Let him give you a different perspective, and it'll change everything. And you want to know, change it to what? Well, that's pretty simple. Another course I took in college was an intro to psych course I took my freshman year. And, uh, and if you've ever taken an intro to psych course or any kind of psychology class, this is probably going to sound familiar to you. You will have heard something about this. But we talked about this practice called self-talk. Self-talk is basically the inner dialogue that happens in your head. It's you talking to you. So it's like, you know, when you uh, when you stub your toe, you step on a Lego and you want to cuss, but you don't do it out loud, that's self-talk, okay? That's inner dialogue. When you get cut off in traffic and you're, you're screaming in your head, but nobody's around to hear you, that's inner dialogue. How about this one? When you make a mistake and you know it, and it's a big one, and you just beat yourself up over it, that's self-talk. It's inner dialogue, things that may not ever be said out loud but you say them to yourself. And, and psychologists will tell you that self-talk has huge influence over who you are and how you see your life. And so one of the practices that counselors or psychologists will recommend pretty frequently to people who wrestle with anxiety or depression or poor self-image or self-esteem is to practice what they call positive self-talk. So it'd be things like this. It'd be things like maybe you naturally say to yourself, I'm such a failure. Nobody loves me. My life's a mess. Nothing's ever gonna get better. I messed that up so bad. You know, it's those negative things that you say to yourself. It's, it's, it's those negative ideas or questions or beliefs about who you are, thoughts, all those kind of things. And, and what they would have you do with positive self-talk is combat those things by literally intentionally saying, whether you do it out loud or just quietly in your head, but you intentionally say positive things to yourself. So instead of saying, oh, I'm such a failure, you would say, I can do this. Or instead of saying, oh, I messed that up so bad, you can say, I can get it better next time. Or instead of saying, oh, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, my life's a mess, you would say, my life has potential and my life has worth, and my life has value and meaning, I have purpose. It's saying things intentionally to yourself that are positive to combat those negative things. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna give you a piece of positive self-talk that you can use in the moments where you feel that battle between the part of you that so badly wants to do what you know Jesus wants you to do and it's battling against the part of you that just really wants to do what you want to do. Because that's what's going to push back on you doing what Paul says, being a living sacrifice. It's that urge, like, I don't want to die to myself. I want to live my way. When you're in those moments of battle, I want to give you a piece of positive self-talk that can help you out. And if you'll make this an intentional part of your routine and your thought processes in those moments, that battle gets a little easier. So I want you to repeat this after me, okay? You ready? It's not about me. It's all about him. It's not about me, it's all about him. If you will say that to yourself in those difficult moments, guys, I guarantee you that battle gets easier over time. I promise you, and you know how I know? I know it's true because that perspective, according to Paul in this chapter in Romans 12, is exactly the kind of perspective that helps us understand our purpose. Paul calls that God's good and pleasing and perfect will. And he says, if you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind, if you will let God do that in your life, you'll be able to see what it is. You'll be able to discern it. You can figure it out, what God wants from you, that purpose that he's put in your life. You'll be able to get a clearer picture of it. And so the rest of this chapter is Paul going on to explain how that should start to play out in our lives and, and how our lives should look once we've been renewed in our thinking. He, he gives us really kind of two areas of focus. The first one starts in verse three, goes through verse eight. And in this passage, he explains that every single one of us has a gift that we've been given by God to meet a need in partnership with the church. So check this out, starting in verse three. He writes, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. He says, you have a gift. 
And it takes all of us working together with our unique gifts and our unique wiring and our unique personalities and and, and who God made us up as unique individuals. It takes all of us working together for the church to really function the way it should so that we together as one body can be effective at reaching people who are lost and searching and giving them the hope of Jesus. And without any one of you, we are not as effective as we ought to be. So whatever your gift is, whatever you're good at, whatever God's given you that you excel at, if you're not using it, then you're holding the church back from reaching more people with the same hope that you've experienced in Jesus. It takes all of us working together. And Paul says when God, when he renews your mind, when he reframes your life for you, when he helps you see your life differently and it takes on a new shape, the first part of that is you understand, I need to leverage the gifts that I have in my life to help. I need to get in the game. That's part one. Okay, but I told you there are two things that Paul tells us and the second starts in verse nine, continues through verse 21 and it doesn't have so much to do with how we interact together as a church as it does you individually and me individually and what our lives should look like when God renews our minds. And so I wanna read these verses to you and I just want you to listen to these verses and ask yourself as I read these, what if more of us looked more like this picture that Paul's about to paint? What kind of world would we live in? It'd be a lot better world to live in. Check this out. He says this, love must be sincere. I mean, we could stop right there, guys. If we all loved sincerely, could you imagine the difference in the world? Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. In other words, don't only care about people that can do something for you, love unconditionally. Don't be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, this is kind of funny, he says you will heap burning coals on his head. Somebody drive you crazy, you don't really like them, you want to really tick them off, just be nice to them. That's what Paul says. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a long list of things. Some of them may seem pretty easy for some of you and others may seem near impossible. It's a long list, but could you imagine if more of us, if our lives looked like that, the difference it would make in the world. Could you imagine what kind of place it would be to live? Here's what all this comes down to, okay? I I know this isn't easy to, to reflect all these things in your life, but it comes down to this. Your life is not your life, it's a trust. Your life is on loan. Your time, your talent, your treasure, it's not yours, it's God's. He owns it. You get it for a second, but trust me, life is fast. And all that stuff's gone before you know it. And so the question is, how do you invest it? What do you do with it during the time that you're in this world so that it pays a dividend that lives beyond you, right? Your life is on loan and you've been given free will. You've been given the ability to decide for yourself what you're gonna do with all this stuff. But let me tell you, if you choose to make it about you, you will will strive for more and more and more and more and more. And you will kill yourself in the pursuit of more and more and more and more and more and more because it's never enough. When you make your life about you, it's never enough. It's always about, I need to be better. I need to do better. I need to climb higher. I need to achieve a next level of greatness. And it's all about you. And it's, it's the most unsatisfying way to live. But if you will let God renew your mind and reprogram your thoughts, change the way you see your life, And remember how you see your life shapes your life. So if you change the way you see your life, it takes on a different shape, maybe more like what we read here in Romans chapter 12. If you will do that, then that endless, fruitless, vain pursuit of more can stop and you can finally breathe. And I know some of you in the room this morning, that's what you want. You just want to breathe. You just need that weight off your shoulders. 
And so here's where you start this week. Four things for you to consider. And I wanna challenge you to make these, you gotta make this a daily thing. This can't be like, I went to church Sunday, I heard a sermon, there were some good things in there I kinda liked, so my life changed. It doesn't work that way. You have to make this a habit. It has to be a daily thing. Four things to consider. Number one, think more about others than yourself. Number two, think like a steward, not an owner. It's not yours, you get to manage it, so think that way. Number three, think about your work, not what others are doing. Don't be focused on everybody else. You think about what God gave you to do. Focus there. If we'd all do that, it'd be amazing the amount of stress we would just eliminate from our lives. So think about your work, not what others are doing. And number four, think of ministry as an opportunity, not an obligation. And listen, ministry is not doing what Pastor Ryan does or what I do or people who work here. Ministry is not coming and sitting in an office here, clocking in at the beginning of the day and clocking out at the end of the day. Ministry is Romans chapter 12. Ministry is using your gifts to serve. Ministry is having your life reflect Jesus to other people, loving genuinely, serving, forgiving, showing mercy. That's ministry. So think of that as an opportunity, not an obligation. Jesus said in Luke chapter nine, verses 23 and 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. That's one of those bad marketing slogans. But it has to be daily. And it starts with one step at a time. You don't wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden your whole life looks like Romans chapter 12. But every day, you just get a little better and a little better, and a little closer, and a little closer. And the best part is, it's God renewing your mind. It's not you. He does the heavy lifting. And you just have to let him. You have to hold it open-handed. So if you will do this, if you will live with this posture that says, it's not about me, it's all about him. It's not about me, it's all about him. If, you will, if you'll just get that far, God will take it from there. And here's what'll happen. You won't be like the rich young ruler that when Jesus says, hey, I want you to surrender this to me. You have to hang your head and go away sad because you can't do it. You see, if you'll just get that far where you can say, it's not about me, it's all about him and God will take it from there, then when Jesus asks you to surrender to something, you will have already experienced the joy and the fulfillment that comes from following him and trusting him and it becomes a whole lot easier to give him everything you've got. And then your life will be different and your life will have meaning and your life will have purpose like you've never experienced it before. I wanna read you those first two verses from Romans chapter 12 one more time, but I wanna read them from the message translation. And I wanna ask you as I read these to close your eyes and listen to these words and to make this your prayer uh, today and this week. So uh, close your eyes and let me read these to you. And this is our prayer. Paul says, here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping and your eating, your going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, but instead fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. God, that's our prayer. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Above all the noise and everything going on in the world around us, all the patterns that we see, God, help us to focus on who you are and, and only that and, and to hold our lives open-handed so that you can work and you can do what only you can do. Just like we sang earlier, God, we pray that your spirit would move in us. Uh, God, we wanna look more like Jesus. And so we trust you that if we'll meet you there, if, if our posture will say, it's not about me, it's all about you, that, that you'll take it and you will work and you will Help us to look more like you. Uh, God, that's our prayer today. That's our prayer every day. Make us more like you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.